thank you for the privilege of being your pastor. I'm not sure if you're happy about that, but that's the way it is. It's like uh, when I sat there and I saw an artist on the side of the pulpit and I was trying to read it without my glasses, and then I put my glasses on. And I, I read there, it says, mind the step when you step onto the pulpit. Now I've already stumbled into this the low step here before I saw the sign. And that's how it is in ministry. Sometimes you, you stumble into things and you just go forward. My name is Hanalei Grant. I'm married to Hanalei. My son is there, Hanalei. He's married to Hanalei. And the little one there is Hanalei. I have a daughter that is Nandi. And she is married to Gordon. They are in the world conference. Um, I've been a son of an evangelist. And we traveled from town to town, three months at a time, to spread the gospel. That was in the old days. I've been to nine schools because my father was moved around a lot. I started my theology course in 1978, many years ago. I've been back to Aldergood three times at different occasions to go and do some studying there. And um, I'm a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist. That's about all you need to know about me. Uh, the rest you will find out as we go along. I would like to remind you as a church that my time to speak starts when I start to speak. And the clock starts working when I start speaking. So it's five to twelve. So my time starts now. When I was at the Oklahoma College uh, some years ago, uh, at the head of I also lectured with the South African Bible Association. And in the afternoons, when we start our class at 2 o'clock, I would lock the door. The students were late, they are outside. If I miss more than five classes, they off the course. And if I see them asleep or doing this, I tell them to stand up. But if I look at you, and we don't know why, it might be because you need to maybe stand up because you are not, not awake. People may God bless you. Uh, I'm looking forward to the ministry with you. I have pastored some large congregations in the past, up to 16, but it is still not the ideal situation. I'm going to do my best to do justice to all of you with the time that we have together. May God bless you. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we commit ourselves to your care and have your hand to study what happens in the worship hour. I pray to the Lord that you will indeed meet with us and we will have communion together. Bless us now in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm of the God speaking. Uh, when I was at school, Standard 2, I got a prize at the end of the year for the best progress in English. From failing, almost passing, passing, and then passing with good grades in the fourth quarter. And my teacher struggled. I remember the words Mrs. Maru, she will say to me, You must think in English when you speak. I said, How do you think in English? I was thinking in Afrikaans, translating it into English, and it was a mess. Even though I went to college, uh, to my surprise, you know, uh, the college was English, and uh, I sat with the dictionary to translate my textbooks. And after a while, some of my fellow Afrikaans students came to say, What are you doing with these English books? I said, I translate. I said, Can't you have your copies of your, of your notes? And that is, this is how I learned English. So if the words come out wrong, I need to have a spirit of the rest, like we can need to say. I always say to the people in my congregations, regardless of what I say here, if you are tuned in to the Holy Spirit, you will hear the message that is meant for you, regardless of what I say. Of course, we are in verse John 4, verse 23, 24. I'll read it again, I'm going to read it again. It says here, but the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father 
in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. If the Bible says there is worship in spirit and truth, there should be a false system of worship. That is the implication of the text. Matthew 7 verse 21, the Bible starts by saying, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. This implies to me that there is a form of worship. It is he's talking to a group of people, a religious group, preferably, uh, and he is addressing them. He says, Nobody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, that day I will come to that. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And in the modern day world, I can add speaking in tongues, doing miracles of healing and other things that accompany these spiritual phenomena. And I will declare to them, I, not I have not known you, I never knew you. You who transgress the law of God. In that day, the judgment day, when the true motives of our hearts are being revealed, I would like to start by saying to you that worship has to do with outward things and with inward things. And the Bible is clearly saying to me, what you see on the outside is not necessarily true worship. So there must be something on the inside that is of more importance. So there are two. There are two worshippers and there are false worshippers. And throughout the sermon, you need to ask yourself in which category do I belong? Now you will say to me, we, we are here as children of God, first of all. We are here as same dad and dentists, we be baptized, we've been following the instructions of the Bible, we are reading the spirit of prophecy. Yes, that is true, but even so, we can be false worshippers. The Jews thought that because they were born into the succession line of Abraham and David, they are now children of God. For that reason, they did not reach the conversion when John the Baptist called upon them to be baptized and said, We are already saved. We are part of the kingdom of God. Yet they were far away from the kingdom of God. They had all these things attached to their system and they had a form of worship, an outward display of what they considered worship to be. But Christ said, No, you need to be converted, you need to be saved. And more, more exceedingly, Nicodemus, who was, a, who was a, a senior pastor in the church, a member of the St. Peter, he said, You need to be born again. I, it reminds me of the testimonies of Alan White, where she writes to pastors, testimonies to ministers and gospel workers. She said, Many of the pastors preaching and teaching, ministering to the people, need to be converted. How many of you if I tell you that we need to do We could make the same mistake, thinking that our membership in the church will translate us to be saved children of God. In the 10 days of prayer that I started Wednesday nights, I hope you are part of this process today is the group or privately at your home. There are many uh, presenters on the internet, on YouTube and Facebook that present virtual presentations on the 10 days of prayer. I, I would like to encourage you to be part of that. So that in 10 days time, God can do something with your life and maybe turn you in another direction. I was training blind people before my previous occupation. And I would teach them how to cross the street, how to cross robots. And some of these situations are very really difficult. And, and we train them to approach the curb 
in a straight line, he imagined and, and, and envisioned a straight line as they call the very practice. That's not going to get it right. If, 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 you, if your eyes are closed, you must try and walk in a straight line. You walk balance and you don't walk straight. That is one of the facts of life. And sometimes when they stop at the curb across the street, I will tell them as an instructor, you are not straight. And they have been taught how to, how to fix that by listening and by using the white pen. And sometimes if they don't correct themselves, I will take them on the shoulders and I will turn them and say to them, this is where straight is. Now the Holy Spirit does that with us. He will take us when we think we are straight and turn us to say to us through the word of God, this is the position where you have to be safe. Look there and follow that line. Pretended worshippers versus true worshippers. Outward religion versus inner sanctification. Form word worship versus true worship. What did the Jews do? Matthew 25 verse 5 is a story. They cherished their religious groupings. Christ said in verse 8, uh, talking about the borders, the seams of the garments of the Pharisees, he said, you make them big, large. Why is he saying that? The Pharisees, the Pharisees had clothes that indicated the people that they were religious leaders. And the seam of this garments indicated what brand they had. And they would move around the people according to these rags, indicating that they belong to a specific group and their education level. I visited a, 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 a prayer meeting group, an interdenominational prayer meeting, and uh, the lady playing the, the piano this morning said to me, Pastor, uh, I so much wish that my husband could hear you when you preach. I said, well, why, why does he become? She said, no, he, he was the pastor of, it, of, this, of this town for the last 50 years. He's now retired. He will not come here. You will have to go there. And I said, no, no, in my way, I will come. And I went to his house. And his very first words that I entered into the door, he said to me, what level of education do you have? How many years did you study? Are you on the same level as me? And we started the conversation by the grace of God's uh, we broke away that out of the form. And I decided, I discovered there was a man inside who was longing for the things of the Bible, who was lost in tradition, position, honor. Christ did not follow that trend of having been clothed with clothes that, that distinguished him from the people. That, John, the testimony of John the Baptist was, was, was simply that if you look at the crowds after the baptism, you could not point out to Christ where he was because he was the same as the people. There was no distinctive form outwardly. And it is not strange for me that Christ promised us what? In the book of Revelation, he says, I will give you, if you overcome, a white robe of my righteousness, a simple, plain road. That is the road that Christ recognized. Uh, I find it not strange in the ten days of prayer, the very first lecture was Christ talking to Adam and Eve. And the very thing, this thing that happened after they sinned is God took away their clothing of light. The outward sign of who they are. Religion can be an outward display, and God said, if I remove that, what is left? What is left? He took away what he supplied, and we cannot supply that from outward worship. Matthew 23, verse 6, the front rows, Christ was talking to the Pharisees again, and he was telling them, if you, if you go to uh, where he don't take up the front seat because they are there for the family for the special guests. This, the, the, the person of the house will come and say to you, listen, can you please move back? I've got important people sitting here. But if you're sitting there in the crowd, they will call you to the front. That is better. And then what first is indicating to them is that the position 
that is there for us in his kingdom is not determined by land, by social stance, by economic measure, but simply by character. Uh, James and John, in the last week, before the crucifixion, the desire of Moses says that, 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 that usually they walked as a group, but this time, for some strange reason, the disciples was walking a little bit behind Christ. He was ahead of them. And there was a reason. They were discussing their positions in the new kingdom. And when he arrived at Jerusalem, one story says, the mother said, the other one says, they came with the request, Lord, can we, the two brothers, James and John, sit on your bed, on your right hand, and on your left hand, when you sit on your throne? They didn't realize that the positions that they were asking in a few days' time, four days' time later, Christ will be hanging on the cross and left and right of him will be people who will be suffering the same punishment that he got. That's where they would have ended up if they were given that place. But he said to them, that place is determined by my father. Christ knows we from inside and outside. And he has a desire for to say to prepare a place for you in this world as well as in heaven. That will be the place that we will grant us. Uh, when I came to the P district many years ago, uh, it was strange to me that four or three of, of the elders approached me separately and invited me to a special lunch. And I thought that was great. And then afterwards, uh, while we were busy, one of them took out the little book and said, Pastor, I would like to tell you what's happening. I said, that is fine. And then he started giving me instructions what I was doing. I said, tell them just, just stop, stop there. We will, we will do this together. We'll be cheerful in the congregation. And they were trying to soften me up and to get my favor to see. They were testing me to see on what side I will sign. Because there were groupings in the church. I, I actually loved the presentation this morning, especially the introduction text that says that uh, we were happy when we gathered in the sanctuary for the first time. I was in a district where after a year, three months, for the first time, I had the whole congregation in church because they were split into four little groups. Divided over the health message, divided over the spirit of prophecy, divided because of cultural differences and the rest was just difficult. And I passed them in the morning, they were waiting to me, we go here, we go there, we go there, but not in church. And uh, I read the text that says, I was happy when I said to him, let us go to the house of the Lord. Outward and inward worship. What does God think of this? Religion can be something to do, or it can be the fruits of the Spirit. It can be because of association in God's presence. Matthew 23, verse 23 says, What did Jesus also do? Of the Pharisees, the Jews. They pay offerings and tithes. Christ refers to this. They do welfare. They fast twice a week. They pray three times a day. When the rich young man came to Christ, Christ said to him, he said, What must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And he started reciting his resume, you know, all the things that he did as honored guest of the of the leadership of the church. And Christ said to him, you lack one more thing. I will sell all those things. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. And the man went away. He was sorrowful. We came to the church. We participated in religious activity. But that is not necessary to worship. Now, what is to worship? Uh, I heard the word covenant a couple of times this morning. I know it talks about the covenant of sacrifice. When you give up something, because of the cause of God. You are impelled by the Holy Spirit to bring forth the fruits that 
is from the inside of your heart and not out of the display. Being a sacrifice to God, that costs us nothing. I read this book of prophecy is sinful. This is many times we come to preach and we do not prepare properly. We come and, 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 and we, we, we preach from our, our memory. Something that didn't take us time or money to produce. 44 years ago, I met a young lady and we fell in love. And that was the worst time of my life. I, I just completed one and a half years of, of theology course. And the South African Defense Force, through the government, decided we are drafting you on the go. Uh, and um, they took me. And they said to me, for the next two years, you are mine. And it was the first time. At that time, I met not leave. And I went to orientation training as a chef later on. And after six months, they posted me in the, in the base. I was at six different military bases throughout the term. And things started happening. From the beginning, I had problems with my religion, with the way I wanted to worship. First, the first thing was the Sabbath day. And I said to myself, what are these people? You know, when I was doing my course throughout those six months, I said to the Lord in my prayer daily, Lord, you have placed me in the wrong place. Because the Spirit of Prophecy says, God will guide our feet to train us for the work that we have to do in the future. And if he's doing that, how can he allow me to become a chef if chefs work seven days a week? And I was so troubled. And when I ended up the very first day, the staff sergeant said to me uh, all the things, and then I said to the staff, there's one problem, I'm a second-day Adventist, I don't work on Saturdays. And the sergeant major was on the side there, and I will not say what he said, but because he's not suitable for the church. But he chased me out of the kitchen. He said, you go and work wherever you want, you don't come to my kitchen. You're going to cause strife in my kitchen. If I give you up one day a week, what are the others going to say? And I have to go back to the HQ with the sergeant major and to the colonel to plead for them to sort this out. And after a long story, he phoned the sergeant major and the teacher saying, Listen, this man is a second day Adventist. You work around that problem, it's your problem. Thank you, he's been trained as a chef, he's good, he will serve them. First problem solved, I can tell you for the rest of my military service, I struggled from week to week to get a Sabbath pass. I occasionally got the weekend pass in the second period. But I worked from 4 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock at night, a double shift where the shifts, the shifts worked from 4 to 2 o'clock and then the other shift from 12 o'clock to 9 o'clock. I worked on both shifts because I was an Adventist and I had the privilege of a Sabbath pass from Friday evening to 12 o'clock Saturday night. That was a covenant of sacrifice I made to the Lord. Second problem is that if you work those hours, there's no time for worship. Our days of prayer is calling us to the family altar to start evening and morning worship again. And I made a covenant with the Lord. I said, Lord, before I would like to start 4 o'clock in the morning, I have to prepare for inspections and other things so I need an hour at least. So before that, I need time to study the Word of God, to pray and dedicate myself to the course. And for the rest of my military service, 20 past 2 in the morning, the Lord woke me up. Uh, I, I, read, I read this morning again, Isaiah 30 verse 4, the very same words, where Christ says, God wakes me up in the morning. If you ask Him, if you make a covenant with Him, He will see that you get you see his face before you see anything else in the day. And that has been my lifestyle for the next 44 years of my life. So to this day, I get up that time in the morning to study and to pray. Because that is the covenant I made with God. Then when I'm finished, I go back to bed and I sleep further. I'm disturbed for the rest of the day. But if I allow the day to start in the morning, Things start happening, the telephone start giving you start doing things. There is no time for religion in that way. Personal worship before God. People, you need to have a place, you need to have a time where you bend yourself down to the king of the universe. 
I was a little bit stupid, right? Uh, the people I was playing with kind of cobras, but I was the shift leader on those shifts until the end of my turn. And the staff said, I want to be there because you're the best, but I cannot give you a rank because it's not the way to say The day when you work on a Sabbath, that's the day I will give you a rank. I was happy. I must tell you that in the last three months of my military service, uh, we got a new officer and commander, we got a new person in the kitchen, and he walked it around for almost four days doing nothing, saying nothing as a new leader. And then he called me, he said to me, there's something strange going on here. He says, you are in charge of the kitchen, but you don't know where. How was that? And I tell him, what's the sad? He says to me, I see that you do not go on the weekend fast because you check the record. I said, what's the sad? And he said, that is the biggest nonsense he ever heard. He went to the colonel and the next week they gave me a rap. They gave me a corporal. And he said to me, I will never see you in the kitchen again besides from 8 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the day and the rest of the day you're off. You don't go shift like the other guys. And I went home earlier than the rest of the boys. At the end, God came through. But that is not the story of today. Do you make a covenant of sacrifice to be true to what you believe, to do the best that you can in the work that God has given to you, and not to conform to the world? That was a bad place for me to be as a young Christian, because there are many things happening, and I'm going to go there. A second sacrifice, the next part of that one. Uh, my wife, because I would. 4 o'clock in the morning, she will get out of bed, she will walk in the pajamas down the street to the little telephone booth because she will get four cell phones. She will phone me because she knows I'm in the kitchen and first the place where I will be is a telephone booth. She will ring me, I will pick it up, she will put it down, I will phone her back and then four goes to the of charge. I don't know why. It didn't cheat. For some reason, if she phones me and I phone her back immediately, the four goes to it. For the next year and a half, we had four o'clock in the morning for five or six minutes a conversation. But she had to get out of bed, walk down the street, four o'clock in the morning, go to phone me and then go back to bed. A sacrifice for the privilege of talking to the one that you love. Do you have a covenant with your wife, with your husband, with your children? The Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Christ said to her, you need to, to, to worship God in spirit and in truth. Not because you must, but because you are drawn by the Holy Spirit. We worship God only. Exodus 20 verse 3 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And I can drag this out as long as you wish. There are people in the world who try to worship angels. The angels in the story of the Bible said to them, do not worship us. We are created beings like you. We worship God. We do not worship the heavens, the sun, moon, and the stars like the Chaldean priests that went to Babylon with the religious things and started the, the reformation of apostasy in the Christian church. We do not worship nature like the Canaanites. We do not worship people like modern people who nowadays do TV stars. Sports heroes. We do not worship animals like the Egyptians. We worship the true God. Revelation 14, verse 6 to 12 says, and it calls upon us to worship the great God. But I was listening to the story of the Pinda this morning, and uh, I just love that piece that was read us. I hope it's available to share with the rest, maybe it can be there for to go to you again. In the time frame with Daniel. The prophecy of Daniel says there will be a time when things will start happening in the book. That in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, he saw an angel with his one foot on the, uh, over the sea, up over the land, and his hand in the air with a closed book, the book of Daniel. But in Revelation, John saw the same picture, but now the angel is standing with one foot on land, one foot on the sea, and the book in his hand is open, the book of Daniel. 
And the Bible says there will be a time in the world where the book of Daniel's prophecies will open and I will brought out of this apostate church a group of people who will serve me. And Revelation 14 is the prophecy concerning the Advent movement. The call in a time when Charles Darwin wrote his book, The Origin of the Species, saying, uh, we are not created beings, we have been evolved through the process of nature. The Bible says, return to the Creator God. In that time frame, 1800s. Return to God in the time when there was somebody sitting in the house of God, pretending to be God, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. The Bible calls out the people to say there is one God, not the person sitting in the church with a religious bound on and pretending to be God. He is calling us back to meditation, to worship, not man, but God. Are you adhering to this promise? Worship is part of the awakening process when the Holy Spirit awakens us to sanctification. In the book of Thessalonians 16, verse 16, the Bible says that three times a year, all males above 20 years of age, those that are fit for military service in the old system in Israel, they have to go to Jerusalem for one of the seven feasts, or three of the seven feasts. And they can choose which ones they want to go. And it was punishable by death if they don't go. He says, you must appear before me, but this is the sense I would like to emphasize. He says to them, when you come to Jerusalem, do not come empty handed. Bring an offering. Something to sacrifice. When you appear to the Lord. I was uh, 29 people that we visited the Abena uh, visit to Botswana. Uh, some of the rural areas where there was still a headsman or a captain of the tribe. And we had to go and ask permission to play people in his territory. And my director was a woman, and, and because she was a woman, she could not speak to the man because he was a great woman. And uh, so we accompanied. And his wife was sitting at the back, and then his, his counselors next to him, and then he was there, and between us and him was an interpreter, and we could not speak to him directly. And uh, some introductions were made, and then there was a long silence, and I, I turned to the interpreter, I said, what is happening? He says, the, the captain is waiting for you. I said, waiting for what? I said, you must open his mouth. I said, how must I open his mouth? You must give him a gift. We had to go back, get a gift, and then come back the next day and, and proceed with the meeting. Now, if we appear before the King of the Universe, is there a certain procedure that we will have to follow? The Bible says, if you come to me, there's a time and a place, and God changed this until it was in Jerusalem, he said, where prophecy will be fulfilled in Jerusalem. That's where you will go to worship. Otherwise, you will fall into an idolatry. Bring a sacrifice to remind you of your faith of why you are coming here. God has a system of, of relieving poverty, and I'm not going to go there for the, for the stranger, for the orphan, for the widow. In a system whereby they can go through the land and pick up sheep. Go through a vineyard or an orchard and pick what is left. The Bible's instruction was very clear. If you harvest your orchard, don't go a second time to the trees. Leave that for the poor. Leave that for the widows. Because that is my system of welfare and care for them. God cares for us in a very special way. We read the morning in the lesson study about the blessings in the verses. There are some blessings in worship. There are some blessings in religion.
you appear before him in his presence and while you are in his presence you have to observe the correct protocol the attitude a heart that's been prepared i often think about this when we come to church we don't take time to prepare ourselves for the second hour you know when, when god called moses to the mountain and he received the law the lord said to him first of all make sure nobody gets under the mountain before the mountain is holy and then he went up and he went alone and for six days moses waited upon the lord nothing is happening and then on the seventh day god called him closer now what happened to you in six days what will happen to you if you sit and you do nothing for six days while waiting to see somebody you will think I've often said to people in hospital that he's on a the sick day because it might be great to God that you will be on a sick day this whole time. Because it gives you time to prepare your heart, to do inner searching and to find out what is what in your life. And then on the seventh day, and when God said, Now you can come closer to me, he said, When you are far away from me, you must start bowing down. You have to choose. Bow down. As you approach to him as the holy God. Worship is when you appear before the Lord. You have communion with him. It is, a, it, is a, it is a situation where there must be reverence, respect, a heart that's being prepared. The religion has got some emotions, some excitement, uh, when God does things for you. And uh, you will see what God has done, and you will have adoration, you will have respect, you will have praise. But you need to prepare it to Him. The word worship, when a subordinate worships the figure of authority, and in the Old Testament it is always talking about God, there is no other connection with the word worship except for God. If you worship false gods, it's a different word. We can only worship God. Christ said to, uh, to Moses as the angel of the covenant, don't go into the tabernacle at any time, and when you go into the tabernacle, fix your head. I can't understand this. I think God said, well, come your eye out. I see any cat in the do we appear before the Lord? Uh, the Tabitha was talking about now, her father was an ambassador to some foreign country. And at the end of his career, in 90 something, he was called to be honored and receive a specific, a specific play or something, a reward for his services. And the letter said, the dress code, you must have a pinstripe suit, a leather belt, a hat and proper leather shoes. That's the fire. And if there's a lady company in you, she might have that one. Worship, sometimes I wish it to be formal. But we appear before the God of the universe. You come to God, you meet with Him in person, in His presence. At places of worship, on the Sabbath, prayer meetings, personal devotion. You prepare your heart. You are respectful and truthful. You bring an offering of thanksgiving. You praise Him with song and with worship. I often ask the people in my congregations, what have you done to honor God? Have you ever written like David a poem for the Lord? What prevents you from writing a poem to God like a song? Sing a song to him. Play on an instrument like the Jews did. They were quite a jolly nation. And they did many strange things in religious worship. We study the word while we worship. And while we study the worship, we are being changed from the inside to the outside. Our actions on the outside conform to what is done inside of the heart. That is what worship is all about. It's not about the place. David said that I was reminded of what you did by the children saying these heavenly verses. I saw a lot of evangelists this morning. 
performing there. Maybe God will call the ministry to ministry in some capacity. But the New Year, chapter 6 says, we must train our children since they are young. When we go out in the streets, when we lie down in our everyday life, teach them, write it on your doorposts, on your walls. The words connected to praying is prostrate to the Hebrew language. It is not just kneeling down. The Hebrews actually lie flat down on their faces in their worship. Sometimes they make on hands and knees, yes. We stand, we kneel, we sit, we pray. I think each occasion must be coming for itself, what is appropriate. But sometimes we are here to what we do when we approach the kingdom of the universe. We will never get to the, uh, I recall, <laughs> I was sitting in an executive meeting and one of the union presidents was addressing the conference uh, officers. And there was one director who was, maybe he was tired, I don't know what happened, but he was sliding down on his chair and was sitting on his backside, you know, like we sometimes do in church up at the school. And the president went in and said, he says something wrong with your back. Maybe he did that, he said like this. He says, no. he said, well then get up and sit up straight. You are an executive meeting, you don't have to find your backside. What is our attitude when we approach the king of the universe? Yes, we are going to lie down our face to our views. The togetherness of worship, Hebrews 10, verse 25, communion with others and worshippers, do not neglect getting together in church. Sometimes we do that. We skip one day, we skip two weeks, and that is the, that is the, that when we apostatize, we, if you skip once, the second time is easier. It's like when you go to the white line in the car. But the first time you feel guilty, the second time you just do it. You go on. Until you turn yourself to get back to the road, to the, to the groove of the roads. People do not backslide. Do not forsake the assemblies of the saints of God. The Bible says we must be true worshippers. Worshippers in spirit and in truth, with vigor. Let the Holy Spirit enlighten you. You are in the presence of God, to meet with God, to meet with other saints. And then I would like to say to you, I don't know what you're here. But maybe you should just go back and think about the way that you worship. And if you worship at all, if you've made a covenant of sacrifice to the Lord, saying, Lord, from now on I will dedicate some time, somewhere in the day, at some place, either alone or with my family to you, and from there on you can direct my life, and you will change. I wish it from inside to also reflect in my outside life. May God bless you. Amen.